Everybody, welcome to another uh, segment of um, Quasar Alchemy. This is um, a segment called Talk on Tones, and we're super excited about this. And I wanna, I'll turn this over to our producer, um, Sarah. Thanks, Evans. Welcome to Talk on Tones. This is a, a documentary idea that I've had for a little while um, to evolve the discussion from a cinematography place of representation on screen. And because I liked various skin tones, I've traveled all over the world, I was always curious about how that wasn't translating from a documentary aspect that I'd work in into a narrative aspect in the world where resources seem to be more than documentary. Why isn't it being translated properly still? Why are people of color, specifically black people, still underlit? Um, and there's also the topic of lazy cinematography because cameras are so sensitive to light these days in the digital world. It's easy for anybody to throw a lens on a camera, point it at somebody and make a nice picture in some regard. So then Evans and I had this evolution of conversation on, on really good practice of cinematography versus lazy cinematography and getting around properly lighting various skin tones. But then the bigger picture is to tie in the personal experience because for me, working in documentary, I am very close to subjects, real life subjects in all different countries and all different languages. And as I translate my career into narrative, time, time versus money versus getting it done versus someone's personal experience, it's always the personal experiences that are thrown to the wayside to get it done under budget. So that personal experience of somebody on screen is that's something that you take home. And what I'd like to do is build a better humanity in the world of filmmaking and the industry that I love because I think it's important. So I'm kind of coming at this from a humanitarian perspective, but also as a cinematographer who's curious to expand that discussion and educate on that. So thanks for joining us today. And, um, and I can't wait to hear from all of you on your experiences in that respect. Um, thank you so much for having this talk. Um, I know that I personally, I, most actors or directors, black, black people have dealt with the problem of people not not trying to figure out how to light dark skin and feeling like it's it's something that doesn't need to be talked about or doesn't need to be learned and that it's just too hard to do it um so i'm really glad we're having this talk to just um illuminate some some stories behind that and also give some tips on how to do it well um, but my background of course is is, is acting um, i was an actor in dallas texas um, in theater and then I started to slowly move into production spaces and then eventually become a director myself. And so a lot of that background has really informed how to direct act, how I communicate with, um, with the production and all departments. Um, I did my first, my, my debut was on Queen Sugar last year, season four. Um, I got to direct an episode um, there and it started off my whole career. I started working on Legacies, Siren, and I did an episode of Lucifer, which should come out very soon, but it's been on a nice roll and I'm so grateful to be where I am because now I can have some influence when it comes to these conversations. I also forgot to say that I'm currently in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm currently in, Lake, in um, Abuja, Nigeria. So I'm a, a few hours ahead of everybody. Uh, my name is Myron Perrin. I'm in Los Angeles currently. I'm a cinematographer and I do direct as well. Um, I've been in the industry for about 20 years, uh, touched down on just about every genre, 3D, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, even done a documentary for two years in Africa with BBC. So um, I've kind of spanned the globe as, as far as um, different genres. And I've seen the same problem or the same issue that we're talking about throughout the year. So it's, it's great to be a part of a conversation that addresses it. Uh, my name's Kevin Hanchard. Uh, I'm an actor based out of Toronto. Canada. Um, Sarah and I met on a small, uh, a small indie film that, uh, that was shot a couple years ago and we struck up a friendship. We've kept in touch ever since. So thank you so much, Sarah, for bringing me on board for this. Uh, my background, mostly much like Bola, it was uh, theater. I'm a, I'm a classically trained theater actor and, uh, and did that for uh, the bulk of the first 15 years of my career. And then uh, through the grace of God, I started working in film and television and haven't left ever since. My journey, um, you know, 
uh, on stages, I've learned um, what it's like to be underlit and improperly lit. Um, and I've also seen what it's like to be properly lit, to just even feel that difference and to have people tell me, uh, you know, anecdotally what, what it's like to actually see your face, to actually be able to, to, to uh, see the expressions and to see the richness uh, of, of, your, of your flesh under proper conditions. And that stuck with me. Um, and now in film and television, um, the same problems still persist. Uh, and it's, you know, we're, we're talking about lighting mostly, but, you know, it exists for hair and makeup as well. Uh, so th this, is, this is a subject that, um, that is like an onion. And uh, hopefully we're just going to start with a single layer here, but really get to the core of it and, uh, and hopefully affect some change. So I'm glad to be a part of the conversation as well. Hello, um, I just want to say thanks so much to Quasar, to Evans and Sarah for having me today. Um, I actually got my first light from Quasar, which I have right now in my setup. This little guy right now doing some fill. Um, so yeah, I'm really grateful for you guys and your existence. And the talk on tones is something much needed and important discussion that we need right now. Um, my background stems from acting. I went to Carnegie Mellon for acting and I booked my first film when I was in acting school. And I grew up doing Shakespeare, musical theater, all that kind of stuff. And my experience on that set was really interesting. Um, just dealing with hair and makeup, um, standing on my mark and saying my line and all the lighting. So I experienced all the discrimination during that time. Um, I moved on to fashion design and then I dabbled into a little bit of DJing and music. And that's when I discovered that I was really into, you know, videos and film and Comp compositing and you know painting with light so I went to audio and video production school um, it was a boys club and I found my education outside of school and I found my set myself on the set of the old man and the gun and I was a production intern and they encouraged us to get on set and when I did um, I was an extras wrangler helping out with talent but we shot in the airy flex 416 um, on film and just the magical of this, that just made me realize that I wanted to be a cinematographer. And it was around the same time that Rachel Morrison was the first woman nominated to get an Oscar. And like, I hadn't seen any women and especially no black women or people of color really being a cinematographer. So that's when I realized that that was something that I really wanted to do. Um, I continued my education and I'm currently a film student uh, majoring in cinematography and minoring and directing at Art Center College of Design. Um, I am also working in operations at Panavision, and I work mainly in narrative films and commercials. My name is Evans Brown. I'm a cinematographer. I came to cinematography uh, via being a gaffer for almost 20 years and that uh, I always wanted to be a cinematographer, but it just it took me 20 years of gaffing to get there. I was always, you know, kind of frustrated. I wasn't able to come out of the gate as a cinematographer, let's say. Um, but once I made the transition, I, I've said this before, I just, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do it any other way. I felt like it was, um, like Kamisha was saying, it was, my training ground. It was where I cut my teeth. It was really, you know, I got to work with a lot of great cinematographers and steal all their ideas. And in New York, I lived in New York, gaffing some no, no to low budget features. Um, eventually moved out to Los Angeles. Um, when I got out to Los Angeles, I was out there for a few years and then um, had a really incredible experience to be the gaffer on the HBO series, The Wire. Um, the DP was a, a great woman, Uta Brzezowicz, and I did the pilot with her and then went back to do, I did uh, season one, season two, and season four. That was my, ex that was my like real experience with, you know, lighting darker pigment darker skin tones and really like deep diving into that and figuring out what that means, you know, and I, I just learned so much on that show um, about that. And I became pretty impassioned about it because uh, 
back then I could really see the problems. We shot on film, so it was even kind of harder than it is now. Well, we can get more into that on a technical level. I am a founding member, member of Quasar Science. Um, I thank you guys for your support and being involved with this. We're super excited about this series. All right, so let's get into this virtual round table. So thanks to Ponder. Um, how have your life experiences, both personally and or professionally, informed your storytelling work? And how have those stories been received by audiences or future investors based on the work itself? So were you supported in the making of that story to create high production value or what was missing? I saw the trajectory of success, what I defined as a successful trajectory, which was visibility, access, opportunity, visibility. So those three pillars working together takes the, the person who is on that trajectory from the next opportunity to the next because you become visible, you access the next opportunity, it becomes visible, you get another job and so on and so on and so on. So the bigger picture of this is that you get to pursue your art, your craft at the next level up and the next level up and the next level up. And in that process, earn a living, hopefully, and that your, your um, quality of life overall expands to whatever you want it to expand to versus remaining at the glass ceiling or below the poverty line, which is where the majority of minority groups have been for far too long in all industries, but specifically in the film and television industry. And I specifically observe that in my own experience and then working with other women who are also trying to be technicians um, that are isolated more so than women working in hair and makeup, which is more, more found than working in cinematography or gaffing or gripping. What I would love to hear from you guys is an evolution on that because we're talking about various skin tones from that aspect um, of your experience. That question speaks to me specifically because I started making my short films because I just, I just wanted to see stuff I wasn't seeing on screen. Um, there are so many directors where I like, I love their work, but their, their work features, it's very monochromatic a lot of times, you know, not necessarily on purpose, just because they are putting the people that they normally are surrounded by on film and the people that they know on film. And sometimes those people, because film and TV is, is, you know, to be involved in it, to be an artist is, is a higher class profession and, and, it, and is easier and more accessible between people who are of a certain class, which then automatically, especially in, um, in LA or sorry, in, in the USA, excludes minority people. So I wanted to do something that injects more people of color or just people of different disabilities. I just wanted to see people who weren't often being featured in a way that they should be featured. I want to see us as heroes, you know? And I, my first short film was um, a, a mermaid film and I got into the AFI directing workshop for women with that script. And I think it was because it was so different, you know, mermaids weren't really in the zeitgeist at the time. People thought I was crazy because it's underwater. There were VFX, there were stunts. It was kind of everything they tell you not to do. <laughs> like there were kids and everything. And then on top of that, I added that I be in it because I am a good swimmer. That was where the practical reasons was I'm a good swimmer, so I'm just gonna do it myself. But also I really wanted um, a black woman to be this mermaid. And it was a lot of training. You know, I did free diving lessons, scuba diving lessons. There's a lot to ask of somebody that I wasn't at the end of the day going to be able to pay a lot of money. Um, I did two crowdfunding cam campaigns. The first one was successful, but it still was not enough money. So I had to pull out loans, you know, beg, borrow and steal, all of that stuff. It was very, very difficult. People thought the idea was cool, but because it was my first big foray into directing, they were really unsure. When you are at a disadvantage when it comes to money, you, there's no other way to just start other than just starting. And so that means that you're starting from the bottom, you're starting zero without any previous work to show people that, hey, I can do this. Um, luckily, I did not let that stop me. Um, I would be lying though if, I, if what I did said it wasn't hard. It was very hard. I did one big aquarium day in 2015 and then it took another year before I did the other three days of shooting. 
Um, and that was after the second group of crowdfunding. Um, so, which comes with its own problems. So, and it was a lot to do by myself because again, to get producers to do a short film is hard. To get producers to do a short film where there's underwater work and so many moving parts. We actually went out on a boat to Catalina Island and did some underwater shots as well. All of this was very much on purpose because I saw a lack of us in sci-fi film and genre films in general. And I love those films, but I wanted to see more of us in there. So I decided to do it myself. Um, after that, after achieving it though, um, people had, did become more supportive, but it took a lot of work. It took a lot of hoops. I feel like there's some demographics who are sort of said like, you wanna do this? Sure, go ahead. And when it comes to everybody else, you're sort of given the gauntlet to go through in order to prove yourself. And it just feels um, like everything's a little stacked against you. I saw your, the mermaid film on- Oh, uh, thanks. I loved it. I love mermaids. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, the <laughs> water <laughs> phoenix. <laughs> you know, and it kind of spills into the, the, the whole topic that we're talking about. Like just as sidebar note, there's uh, Disney was going to make a new mermaid uh, film. Yeah, Holly and, and Chloe, I think is who their names and, are, yeah. Yeah, and so, and I was like, this is wonderful, you know, and they're casting this beautiful, you know, talented, very talented young woman, and there was a lot of pushback of this young girl of color playing Ariel. And well, I, like, oh, I, I can on. say that that's one of the disappointing, that's one of the things that I'm talking about, of fighting against. The, the fact that people will come up with every, they will come up with like scientific reasons why the mermaid can't be black. Like that is what, how deep it is, how deep the, and you, they don't understand you're talking about a mythical creature in the first place. And to now say that there is a reason why she can't be black, it just, there's no thought into how that would make someone feel on the other side of it. Like, you know, you're not allowed to be this magical creature. No, you're not allowed to be the hero of your own story because scientifically, it's not possible. So I just decided to say, nope, not buying it. <laughs> I'm doing it myself. You, you know, it's a funny thing. Um, you know, I had a lot of success uh, on stage in my career. And, uh, but the, the, the toughest thing that I wanna say is that it, it, it's taken time, right? It's taken time to build, up, um, to build up cred, for lack of a better term, and to, and to finally have a voice, to have a voice that you can bring to the table where people actually, Take what you take your concerns seriously. Um, the process has been accelerated considerably over the last month and a half, as people have as people's as people's eyes, and hopefully hearts have been opened up, given given the recent events that have been taking place in the world and the concerns that I've brought to the fore before are now actually being listened to, and people are actually reaching out to me as opposed to receiving uh, the concerns that I've had to put forward. So I'm still learning the the process of you know how to how to act on screen. And, and the, the geometry and the calculus of what that is. Uh, and I'm fascinated by, all, you know, all of you, you artists slash scientists. I, you know, I think you guys are scientists in, in what you do. I want to have a voice. You know what I mean? That's really why I'm here is I want to have a voice and I, and I want to understand, um, you know, why that voice has been silenced and what I can do to make sure that it's not silenced moving forward so that our stories can get told, so that we can be mermaids, so that we can be heroes, so that we can be, uh, that our history um, can can finally be put on the screen in a way that we see fit and not sanitized. So uh, that's that's where I'm at in the process right now. And um, you know, I hope through this and through other things that we can, you know, as I said before, finally affect some some real tangible change. Kevin, on that note, what uh, maybe shared with us some of the challenges that you have faced? You know, trying to get that trajectory going between access, opportunity, and visibility. As a young actor, as a young black actor, uh, who was never an athlete, right? Who was never buff and 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 big and and filling in that filling that that box that so many of us uh, are expected to fill on on film of the quote unquote you know let's just go there of the of the mandingo right like let's let's just do some real talk right now, um, you know that I think that's why I didn't work in film for the first 15 years of my, of my career, right? Because no one really cared about what talent I brought to the fore. They didn't care about that. They're like, well, is he, is he sexually, uh, you know, does he fit that mold? Does he fit that stereotype? Um, you know, now that I've got some gray hair on my chin and, and, and on the sides of my head, 
uh, I can start filling those, those uh, authority roles, those mentorship kind of roles. That, that's what I play. I play cops, lawyers, and doctors. You know, you have a sense of your worth and you know that you can bring it, but never getting that opportunity to do it plays on you. And, and, uh, and I know as actors, that's, that's what we are. We're empaths and it's, you know, we're real sensitive to that kind of stuff. So you, you try to reconcile all that and it's, it's tough. Uh, see, now you got me all, all, all juiced up, Sarah. But, you know, now, now, now that I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on what I can do now and what, what I can do moving forward and, and what this opportunity is because we've seen moments like this in, in history before um, where people say, this is the moment you know, we, we don't have to look any further than, you know, than elections in 2008 saying this is, this is the moment where things are going to be different uh, and then things don't really change. Uh, I, I feel like this is a moment in history where we can, where, where we must, where we must do something. And, and I'm glad that these two paths are aligning because we did start these conversations before um, this, this accelerated social justice movement. So you know, it's Providence, there's a synergy happening here. And, uh, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't take full advantage of it. Hey, Myron, you had some enthusiastic physical re virtual responses to Kevin there. Do you want to pick up where he left off? So basically he was saying that he thought that he wasn't getting opportunities because of his physical stature and that the industry was looking for uh, African-Americans that filled the stereotypical African-American that went back to um, times before he was even born. Um, and I just wanted to say that that's happened throughout history. I think a lot of the things we're talking about or some of the things that have been brought up are not just at African-Americans or specific to African-Americans. For example, the mermaid story, um, there's actually Korean mermaids that are like 80 year old women that dive every day. That's an unknown story about mermaids, but no one would ever think that a Korean woman would be labeled as a mermaid. And that story is one that's been featured on NPR several times and throughout years. In terms of uh, what Kevin was saying and his roles, we know we went from the paper bag test to basically Wesley Snipes. And that's when <laughs> darker skinned uh, actors were brought into favor. Um, but before then you had people like Sidney Poitier and you had a choice between Sidney and you had Harry, Bel Harry Belafonte. So you had two different people there. You, you know, These things we've made progress as progress has allowed us to move forward. Um, when the bigger picture or the industry allows us to have room to move forward, we fill those roles, um, but they're still not fulfilling for us as people because those are ones that have been selected and not ones that we've chosen to take on as ourselves. Um, me personally, I just never let no be a, a, an answer. That wasn't going to happen. Um, I worked on the movie, The Wire, I mean, the series, The Wire, whatever. Um, but the way I got there was I worked one movie called uh, Boycott with Jeffrey Wright, which is Martin Luther King film. I was lucky enough to be given a job by uh, director, assistant director, Karen Davis, uh, Valerie Hampton. And I was a PA. Then I realized I needed to learn these cameras. I don't have any way of learning them. So I went to a local rental house uh, in Atlanta at the time. <laughs> And uh, asked for a job, and the guy said, I don't have a job. I said, I can make a job. He said, all right, what are you going to do? I said, well, every weekend, I know you're bringing these cases in here with tape, and somebody's got to clean them. I'll clean them in return for you teach them each camera that's inside the case. I clean, you teach. You don't have to pay. And the guy said, yeah. Luckily, he realized I knew what my time was worth. And he was willing to exchange it for the knowledge that I needed to get in the industry. Um, one thing I will speak of is that once you do get in and you get access, you will find yourself to be the only one at the proverbial table because you're the first one through the door. And that is more critical to me than the masses that follow behind banging on the door. Because when you're the first one in the room, there's a certain nuance you have to have to listen, observe the room, see how the room operates. You can't just go into these places and into these proverbial rooms and just demand that you can take over. You need to see what you're working with. And a lot of the time, um, when I've been in those positions to be the only minority um, on set some days, <laughs> or in my department, I take note of how the system works, whether it's a small group of people in my camera department and how their system is making them proficient enough to be on these big movies. And these are the reasons why they're getting hired. I don't look at the faces, I look at the characteristics. I look at the 
system that they set up. This is what we do first. This is what we do. And we do the same thing every day. And we end up on big movie after big movie after big movie after big movie. And I take that away. And when I start to build my team, I institute those same things, those same principles. You know, the faces have changed. The principles are the same. Because at the end of the day, the only thing they complain about is if the product isn't as good as the other. And it's usually something technical. We've missed a piece. We didn't take time to do something. And it's not always money because if we know about it, what we can predict, we can prevent. If we already know that that may be an issue, we can already have a system in place and we can already be prepared to be successful. So I agree with the others. There have been some you know, ups and downs in getting entry into it, but now there's more entry into this industry than ever before. I'm, I'm just speaking, I've been in 20 years. There's so many more women, so many more people of color. I'm happy to see you. But it's taken a while. Uh, capitalize on what Myron's saying, like, uh, and I'm a product of that new gate that's opening. You know, it's only because of um, Ava, who's doing exactly what she's doing, of giving a new woman director an opportunity, and and that is the way that that show is designed. You know, people rarely actually come back. It's all about who is the next class, who is the next class. And, you know, I've been in the industry, I didn't mention it before, but I've been in the industry for 14 years now. And I actually worked with Evan on, on True Blood way back when as a PA. I did the same route, basically, that Myron did, is like working your way up from the bottom and paying attention to how things work. Um, I can't tell you, like, I really hated that I, was, I spent eight years as a PA in the production department. I was so annoyed because I wanted to, just like Evan was saying, I wanted to just jump in and just do it. It was, it was difficult to try. It, I just started to learn how people talk on set. And I get a lot of compliments on the fact that I am technically a new director to all these people. And yet I still sound very familiar because I'm familiar with the culture on set, which is something that if you're growing up on the outside of the studio system, like most indie filmmakers, it's a different way that they work on set. So uh, I'm now very grateful for all of those years as a PA because that has taught me how to be who I am on, on set and help me be a more effective director. So when I show up this, you know, young black woman that everybody sees now, because I'm still new, you know, it's, there's some shows, I'm the only black woman they've ever had direct the show. Um, that's very often, even now, you know, with all the gates opening up as much as they can. And I just am very grateful for everybody who's been busting doors because it's finally opening up. And I hope that they now get to be characterized. They get to be chosen based on their talents, not because we fill, you know, because we're a token or we fill a specific a specific box um it's if we got there it's because we worked our asses off to be there in the first place so we're likely just as good if not better than most of the people they've been hiring i would love to hear from kamisha because um i met kamisha in los angeles through women in media which is a great support system for women in media in all departments and and specifically technical departments to try and get us in front of people to get jobs right and so um Kamisha uh, and I were at a workshop and I was talking to one of the technicians at this crane uh, workshop in Los Angeles and uh, Kamisha came over and said, wow, your story sounds a lot like my story. And I was like, wow, okay, tell me your story. I guess it all started from my being inspired by the Women's March. I did the Women's March with my mother. And then it was Rachel Morrison being the first woman nominated to be a cinematographer. And like I said, I saw like a woman doing that. And I was like, I can't believe this whole time I've been a storyteller. You know, I started in acting, but I realized the whole time that I should have been behind the camera. So I ended up moving back to Ohio and um, the only schools for music production was like audio and um, video production. And the most you'll get out of these schools, it was community college. So the most you'll do is like a newsroom situation or like wedding videography. It was a boys club. I was bullied in my camera classes, and so um, I sought like an outside place to learn outside of school. I became a um, production intern on The Old Man and the Gun, eventually asked, and I became the camera PA. Um, and on that set, like I said, it was so magical. I got to touch everything. I learned so much about being in the camera department. Um, that was my realization of, you know, realizing that I wanted to be a cinematographer, seeing those red flashes on an Airy Flex 416. Um, and so like after school, um, I started working in the camera department as a camera PA and other positions. And I realized how hard it was for women 
to go up through the ranks to become heads of the department as a cinematographer and especially black women. Um, that's through that realization, I realized um, maybe I need to, you know, get my bachelor's and go to school. So currently I'm, you know, getting my bachelor's at school. I'm semester six and out of the 22 incoming students, none of them have ever asked me to work on a production. And when I ask for them to work on my productions, I get ignored, I'm too busy, um, you know? So I'm, I'm finding that there's really big holes and gaps in the educational system of discrimination from students. Um, also, I've experienced some things from teachers as well. Um, and so, you know, the education system needs some work and in inclusivity of women and people of color because in my community school, we use broken cameras, 10 year old cameras. And when I was on the old man, and, old man and the gun set, I knew that the cinematic cameras took like three people, you know? And so my first semester of school, um, that's where my real education was, was in the camera house. Um, and then eventually I interned at Panavision and they offered me a part-time position. So I'm currently learning as much as I can at Panavision, you know, all the cameras and gear and all that. You know, there's only 2% women DPs and, you know, women of color DPs were almost non-existent, like 0.001%. And the, the issues with that is that we're not getting the opportunities on set. We're not getting the educational opportunities at Panavision with all those preps, with all those ACs and camera people I see. Like barely 10% are women and then the people of color at, at Panavision are just even less. So, I mean, that goes to show you the work that needs to be done so that we are in the spaces, you know, to create these bigger films. It's appalling to me. You know, I mean, I've taught workshops for years as well. Um, just to, to give you a, a, an idea on age, I mean, I'm 47. I've been in the film industry for about 25 years since I started college in Toronto. And I worked my ass off doing everything in, in Toronto. And I thought, hey, this is, this is the best place to be. And, and I can see the trajectory that all the guys are making that I'm PAing for and assisting for. And I started to try and do that access, opportunity, visibility. And I was only getting one of two or two of three of those pillars lined up. And while it was so easy for them to line up three pillars all the time and their careers just took off and they had agents and everything. And then even, you know, and that was in my 20s. And then when I hit my 30s, it was still happening. But what I would see was guys in their 20s were passing me. It's just, it's just so bad that I initially only was majoring in cinematography that now I've taken up directing. And my experience with directing too and screenwriting, like my first screenwriting class, like what inspires me is women and people of color. And for me growing up as a little girl, I never saw many black women, you know, in action and super heroine characters. So for me, my first screenplay that I wanted to write was a woman of color, super heroine. And my teacher told me that it couldn't be done. She didn't understand why my character had superheroes. Yes, she didn't, she doesn't like superheroes and she didn't want me to write it. And she told me that it was a bad idea. And so like, I gave up on that dream and I like changed my script for her. Cause I was like, I'm not gonna waste my time writing this for her. And then comes to find out, I met Patty Jenkins and her AFI film was a super heroine film yeah you know, i watched that like, film i watched that film because i was inspired by that too um yeah. but yeah don't 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 ever write it for i mean I'm, i don't mean to preach it but don't ever write it for anybody but yourself by the way yeah well yeah can... this one's for me and it's for all of us black people were not really existing in these worlds especially black women and so that's something that inspires me to keep going so that we're visible in these spaces evans we haven't heard from you yet and um <laughs> It, maybe if we can, if we can um, you know, continue on this vein of, of conversation, but start to evolve the conversation you know, from the technical work that you've done, for example, on The Wire, Evans. How have your life experiences informed your choices and how you treat people on set and how you like people on set? Let me start with a story from how I got into photography and this this will come around to this what we're talking about so my my father was a, a hobbyist photographer he took a lot of pictures in a kind of a documentary kind of way um, kind of a Henry 
Cartier Brisson kind of way, walking around with his camera, seeing the picture before he took the picture. Uh, we had a dark room in my house. Uh, I got interested in photography because he was doing it. He put his Nikon around my neck and I never went back. My, my dad was a, was a guy, is a guy that would go talk to anybody. Doesn't matter. We grew up in the not so great neighborhood, very mixed, very everything. It's like you, Sarah, it's just, you know, everyone just played together or whatever. I remember my father, um, I think it was about, it was the mid to late seventies. There was a, there was a black motorcycle gang in Indianapolis called the Naptown Riders. And they were a pretty well-known motorcycle gang. And my dad always wanted to photograph them. So he, um, every, he started one weekend and he went, he figured out where their clubhouse was and he knocked on the door and their bodyguard or the security guard opened and he introduced himself. My name is Hamilton Brown. I'm a photographer. I would love to hang out with you guys, take your pictures and trade for I'll give you free prints. Door slammed in his face. He'd go back the next weekend. He went back like five or six weekends in a row, was called Cracker, Honky, all the same names. Again, this was a very racial time. My father didn't care. He didn't, you know, he just, had a he had a vision that he wanted to photograph so finally he knocked like on the sixth on the sixth weekend um the guy same guy answers the door every time and he the guy was like all right you're either crazy or you're cool come in and have a beer my dad has his body of work of this this black motorcycle gang that's absolutely incredible you know and for the time you know it in that racially tense era, um, we, you know, it was pretty incredible. But my dad never thought about it. He never put words to it. He just did it. You know what I mean? And I, I watched him do this. My dad on the weekends would want to get out of the house. He said, who wants to go on a photographic expedition? I'd be like, I'm going. So he'd get in the car and drive. And he would say, if you want, if you if you see a picture, pull over and we'll take a picture. And I've always thought, well, what does that mean if I see a picture? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, and it wasn't until I was like in my mid twenties that I figured out, you know, studying art and photography that what, what he was talking about, you know? So we would, we would go down in the neighborhoods in inner city Indianapolis and just walk around and, and take pictures. And my dad was just incredible at diffusing tension and through his dry sense of humor and just you know so i got to grow up with this so this listen this is a crazy way to get around to my then getting the opportunity to work on the wire because that that to me was kind of a culmination of my upbringing and being able to be a lighting guy that paid attention to skin tone and paid attention to, you know, because when I got this job, you know, Uta, great, some great cinematographer, she's directing now, she's awesome. You know, her style wasn't really, she was known for her camera work. She was an incredible camera operator. She, she used a Panther dolly and she had the boom in one hand and the 11 to one zoom on the other hand and she spun herself around that dolly and just did incredible work she really gave me the reins to like light that show and the producer of that show kind of didn't want it to be lit and i would i kind of got in tits with them a little bit about like you don't want it to be lit then you're not going to see your actors that you've chosen in this black show you know like it has to be lit they didn't have a rigging crew they didn't have anything. They basically wanted to go into these neighborhoods at night and shoot under the sodium vapor light. So I battled with these producers in the beginning when we were doing the pilot. And, and finally they came around and we're like, okay, I guess we see what you're talking about because we have to see everybody, you know? And um, there was a time where we were shoot. We would did a lot of day exteriors in in downtown Baltimore, and I would, uh, you know, if it was a sunny day and I didn't, if there weren't any clouds out, I and I wasn't having to 
track clouds for Uta and tell her when the clouds are covering. I, I, I always kept like a wall ball with me and I would, you know, there were always kids in the neighborhood. I would get a bunch of kids together and we'd just play wall ball. <laughs> just crazy, sweating, hot, just playing, having a blast playing wall ball. And it was in that moment that I said, oh my God, this was uh, this young experience that I watched my dad. You know what I mean? Because I think I just had the roots to be comfortable. You know what I mean? And I can't tell you how many times mothers would come out and be like, man, we, I so appreciate you sit out here being a white guy playing with our kids. I didn't really know what, you know, like I didn't even know what she was talking about really. You know what I mean? Because I was just kind of doing what my dad did, you know? I think I just tell that just to kind of like where I came from very early on in studying photography and how it brought me into like being known for a guy, a guy now that is called upon to, to do shows that are uh, with characters with darker skin tones. And that's really just because of the wire. You know what I mean?